in the series that we're doing through Christmas Eve, the gifts of Christmas, we're looking at the truth that God is always, always working to get our attention and to draw our attention to Jesus. He's been doing this from day one. And I want to give you a a little nugget uh, to become good Bible interpreters. As you interpret Scripture, and as you seek to to read this and to know it and to understand what it says, I'm going to give you a nugget uh, as as far as your Bible interpretation goes to help you become a, a, a disciple of Jesus who understands his word. And the nugget is this. Whenever you come to a passage that's difficult to understand, or it just doesn't make a whole bunch of sense. Put Jesus right in the middle of it, because Jesus sorts it all out. What we know from Scripture is in the New Testament, Jesus, it's, of course, Jesus saying, all that was written in the law, the prophets, the Psalms, all the Old Testament stuff, he says it was all written about me. So if there's ever a part of the Old Testament That doesn't make sense, just seems odd. If it was written about Jesus, put Jesus in the middle of it, and they'll sort it out. Paul will go on to say that through the scriptures, all the Old Testament, he learned about Jesus' birth, his life, his death, and his resurrection three days later. He learned all of that through the Old Testament. So if there's ever a passage that you come to, and it's like, I don't, It doesn't make any sense. Like, this is crazy. Put Jesus in the middle of it. He'll start to sort it all because it's all about him. You understand that? So so in your disciples, as you grow as a disciple, as a follower of Jesus, just just remember that little tool. It'll help you. And to to, to flesh that out a little bit, uh, we're going to look at some Old Testament passages. We're going to put Jesus right in the middle of it. And we'll see through that how God has been working to draw our attention to Jesus all through the Bible, and hopefully so you'll see that he's still doing the same thing in the work of your life. You put Jesus in the middle, what's going on? He'll start to sort it out and draw your attention to him. This is so much so, in my mind, I go back all the way to Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. And that's the account after Adam and Eve have, have sinned, have gone their own, have chosen their own rules for living, and sinned, God comes to them and says, this is what's going to happen now because you chose to do your own thing, contrary to my word. And he, he talks to them, and then he turns his, his attention to the snake. And God says to the snake, Genesis 3.15, I will put enmity between her seed, Eve's seed, and yours. In other words, I'm going to put enmity between her offspring and yours. But the word that God uses is seed. Now, if any of us understand human biology, when a man or a woman make a baby, the woman doesn't bring the seed to that equation. You understand what I'm saying, right? That's the man's job. But God says, I will put enmity between her seed and yours. Did God get the biology wrong? Did you ever notice that about that account in Genesis 3? Why does God say, I'll put image of return her seed and yours? The reason is this. He was trying to draw their attention to this one who would come. That was born not of man nor human decision, but was born of the Holy Spirit, her seed. If Jesus had come from his seed, he would have been born of man. Jesus' daddy was not Joseph. Jesus' daddy was God. And so God refers to that equation as her seed, trying to draw people's attention to there's something coming. I'm doing something. You're not ready for it. Do you understand? Keep your eyes open. Pay attention. I said last week that most of us miss stuff because we're not looking for stuff. And most of us miss Jesus, especially in the Old Testament, because we're not looking for him there. And most of us similarly, miss Jesus in our own lives and the situation of our lives because we're not looking for him there. We might be looking for help. We might be looking for rescue. We might be looking for, for renewal. We might be looking for change, but we're not looking for Jesus. We start looking for Jesus, even in the situations of our lives, the good ones and the bad ones. We'll start finding him. It's the best gift of, gift of Christmas. 
And so I want to jump back in the Old Testament to 1 Samuel chapter 25. I've been telling you, bring your Bibles with you. If you got one, turn to 1 Samuel 25. If you've got a smart device, look it up there. If you have our app, look it up on our app because all the scripture will be, lit, hit, hit, click a button, the scripture will be there, okay? First Samuel 25, it's the story. We're gonna read about a man named King David and a woman named Abigail and her husband Nabal. Those three are the main characters in this account. So l- let me just, l- let me set up with this in, in verses two and three of First Samuel 25. What the Bible says. A certain man in Maon who had property there at Carmel was very wealthy. He had a thousand goats, three thousand sheep, which he was shearing at Carmel. His name was Nabal, and his wife's name was Abigail. She was intelligent, she was an intelligent and beautiful woman, but her husband, a Calebite, was surly and mean in his dealings. Now let me just tell you what what, what this talk about. This guy, it puts it in terms that they understood in their culture. All these, um, all these goats and sheep, and the boy was loaded. That's the best way I can put it. He would just, he was just loaded, super wealthy. His wife's name was Abigail. The Bible says she was intelligent and beautiful. When it says she was intelligent, it means that she was incredibly wise and discerning. She's a Proverbs thirty-one type of woman, if you understand Proverbs thirty-one. Like she was righteous, she was intelligent, she's a hard work, like she had it going. Not only that, the Bible says she's beautiful. There's three women in all of the Bible that this word is used of. So we could say she's one of the top three prettiest women in all of ancient scripture. This word beautiful is used 11 times in the book of Song of Solomon, which if you know that book, that's a pretty hot book. And so this woman, not only was she intelligent, smart, capable. She was drop dead gorgeous. And her husband, Nabal, was surly and mean. It means he was literally bad, malignant, and vicious. Okay? This was a bad man. It says he was a Calebite. Now, that was from the line of Caleb. If you know your Old Testament history, when Moses was spying out the promised land, he spent, sent a bunch of spies in only two of those spies came back with a positive report of God's faithfulness and capability, Joshua and Caleb. And because of that, they were the only two spies in that whole generation that were able to inherit the promised land, two leaders of the nation, incredible man Caleb was. This was of that, Nabal was of his line. All that goes to prove is, listen, you can have a good start, but not a very good ending. Like some apples do fall far from the tree. You know what I'm saying? And so this one did. And so this was a a beautiful, smart woman, very intelligent and capable, married to a very bad man. Now listen, let me say right up front, this marriage wasn't her fault. She was in a bad situation. Because back in those days, women really didn't choose their spouses. It was kind of an arranged marriage type thing. And so somewhere down the line, Abigail's daddy said, you know what, Abigail, I'm going to set you up with Nabal because that boy is loaded and he'll be taken care of. You don't got to worry about your future, your retirement's secure, you're going to be well taken care of. I'm not going to worry about his character, I'm going to worry about his finances. And so because he didn't care about his character, she got in a real bad spot. Okay, now here's the difference. Um, Arranged marriages in our culture don't exist anymore. And so sometimes, ladies, please hear me, especially you single ones, listen, don't choose a man for what he can provide you. Choose a man for the character that he already has. You understand that? I don't care what he does for a living. I don't care what his accomplishments are. You choose character over accomplishment every time. Because if you get yourself in a bad spot, that's your fault now. Because your parents didn't arrange it for you. Okay, marriage is intended to last forever. That's the intent. And so you go into it thinking, this is the character of a man that I can follow, who will lead me well, and this is a forever thing. And if that isn't first in place, date somebody else. We clear? So if you read verses four through nine, this is the, this is the, this is the, the background of what's going on here. 
Nabal's got all this sheep and, and, and resources, and, and they just kind of send these guys off to, around the countryside to graze and to, and, and to take care of them. And King David, with 600 of his men, are in that same area. And as was customary in that time, because there were those, these marauding bands of, of, of warriors from different tribes and different, different uh, nations, if they saw resources that were just out and about without being protected, they would just kidnap them all and take them as their own. And so it was customary that time for military men or those who had might to watch over these shepherds that were just scattered all around the countryside. And so David and his 600 men took it upon themselves to watch after Nabal's property and make sure that Nabal's interests were protected. Do you understand? You understand what we're talking about here? So you have this king, this benevolent, good, gracious, powerful king who sees someone who has a need, though he might not recognize his need, and chooses of his own grace, of his own mercy, to take favor on him and protect him and bless him. The king didn't ask, or the, the Nabal didn't ask for it from the king. The king just chose to give it. And so in the course of time, David goes to, since 10 of his men, to go to Nabal and say, Nabal, this is how gracious the king has been. This is what he's done for you. This is his favor he's placed on you. This is the protection he's given you. Out of response for your graciousness to the favor of the king, give your own offering back to the king. Honor him as king. And that was, that was a common practice. That those who were taken care of by a an authority would give an offering back, would honor them as the authority that was taking care of, that was blessing them. So this was just customary. David wasn't shaking him down. You know, this wasn't any protection racket type of thing. This is just how it went, and it was understood. So, so, so that's that's what has that's that's what's happened. This 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 benevolent, gracious king has showed favor and gave blessing to someone who wasn't looking for it, who didn't even honor him as king. Okay? Now, let's look at his response. Verses 10 and 11. This, this is Nabal's response. Nabal answered David's servants, Who is this David? He knew who David was. Like, they were writing songs about David. David was, pop, David was the man. He knew exactly who David was. He's just dismissing him. Who is the son of Jesse? Many servants are breaking away from their masters these days. Why should I take my bread and water and the meat I've slaughtered for my shears and just give to men coming from who knows where? What a surly little punk. Understand, those who did not merit the favor of the king, King David, received the favor of the king. They didn't ask for it. The king just was benevolent to them and favored them. And all the king asked for was an acknowledgement of the king's benevolence, mercy, and grace, and authority. Just whatever you can give, give it, give it back. And what he got was an arrogant selfishness. In essence, what Nabal said was why should I take my bread, my water, my meat for my servants and just give it away? Do you notice how selfish he is? Now, here, here's what I want you to understand. What we see in 1 Samuel 25 are shadows. Shadows of God the Father, shadows of the Son, and shadows of us. We see the shadow of the benevolent king, the good king, the gracious king that has bestowed blessing, that has bestowed favor, that has bestowed protection on people that weren't asking for it and didn't even seek it. He just, because he's a gracious king, just gave it. And when that gracious king says, I want you to honor me as king and give me back in appreciation for all I've given you, you have a man say, "What do you? This is my stuff. Why would I give that away?" Do you see the shadow? 
How many times has that been our response in church? I've worked hard. I've produced. Why would I just give stuff away? Do you see the shadow? Look at verses 12 and 13. David's, so that, that's, 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 that's Nabal's response to, to the 10 men that David sent. Uh, and in verse 12, David's men turned around and went back. And when they arrived, they reported every word to David. And David said to his men, boys, get ready. He says, put on your swords. So they put on their swords and David put on his. About 400 men went with David and 200 stayed back with the supplies. So David and 400 of his men get ready for battle. What do you think they're going to do? There's only one reason a soldier puts on his sword. There's only one reason you chamber around. You understand? He's going to get ready. So this man who has received the favor from the king has refused to honor the king as king. And he's refused to offer anything back to the king in appreciation for all that the king has given him. And so the king issues his judgment. In rejection of me as king, the judgment is death. That's what King David says. Do you see the shadows? Do you see the similarities? God is working to get our attention. And he's working to draw our attention to his son and what his son has done for us. And he's been benevolent and good and kind and bestowed blessings. And when we reject him as king, there's only one thing. That is his response. The rejection of the king is death. And that is the, that is the, that's what Nabal and his men are looking at. Now enter Abigail. And this is what the story is really about. Abigail was told what Nabal did. She wasn't privy to what Nabal did. She was responsible for what Nabal did. She was just told what, Abel, what, what Nabal did. And Abigail is the shadow of Jesus. And I love this about 1 Samuel 25. Because most of the scripture is written about heroes, not heroines. Do you understand? You women understand this if you've studied the Bible much. There, there aren't a lot. There are, there, are, there, are, there are quite a few, but there's not a ton of these women who are heroines, especially these women who are pictures of Jesus Christ. Abigail is. And I love that. And so please, ladies, women, if you're a studier of scripture, study Abigail. Notice her character. Notice who she is. Notice how she responds. Notice that she is a picture of Jesus just like you are. So enter Abigail. She's told, these men tell Abigail what, what, what has happened. She hears what, what his response, and verse 18, Abigail lost no time. She took 200 loaves of bread, two skins of wine, five dressed sheep, five sayas of roasted grain, and 100 cakes of raisins, and 200 cakes of, of pressed figs, and loaded them on a donkey. What Abigail is doing is taking responsibility for her husband before this good king. She's taking the responsibility. Nabal did not ask her to act on his behalf. Nabal did not ask her to intercede for him. Nabal is living in rejection of the king, but here enters this one who acts on his behalf and takes initiative to appease the king. She's a picture of Jesus. Look at Romans 5.8. For God demonstrates his own love for us in this, while we were still sinners, 
Christ died for us. While we were still living in rejection of the king or refused to acknowledge his kingship and his authority and his benevolence and goodness and mercy and grace over our lives, while we were living in rejection of that, the intercessor came and offered the gift that would appease the king. She's a picture of Christ. Do you see the shadows? Look at verse 20 and 22. As she came riding her donkey into the mountain ravine, there was David and his men descending toward her. And she said to them, David, uh, and she met them. David had just said, this, David just said this. It's been useless. All my watching over this fellow's property in the desert so that nothing of his was missing. He's paid me back evil for good. May God deal with David, be it ever so severely, if by morning I leave alive uh, one male of all who belong to him. The, the king says, okay, wait, wait, wait. I've been so good to them. I, I've given them, so, I've been so gracious to them. It's useless. Why? Why would I continue being good to them? All they do is reject me. All they do is deny me. All they do is continue to refuse to honor me for who I am. I'm done. You see the shadows? I wonder how many times God could say of me, I've been so good to him. But why, do you, why do you not honor me like you should, Carl? Is it useless? I wonder how many times he'd say that about me. I wonder if you wonder how many times he would say that about you. After everything I've done? After how good I've been? You're still drawing a breath. I've been pretty good to you. You're going to return evil for my good? Deny me? You see the shadows? Basically, the king says, look, all the evil is going to come right back on you at my hand. And this is what the Bible says. Romans 3, 23 and 6, 23. For, the way, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And the wages of that is death. Strap on your swords. You return evil to me for the good I've given you? There's one recourse. It's called the judgment of God because of our sin. But thank God for Abigail. Thank God for the intercessor. Verse 24. She fell at the king David's feet. She fell at his feet and said, My Lord, let the blame be on me alone. Wow. She, she says, Let all of the blame of him fall on me. Who was the who was at fault? Nabal. Who was innocent? Abigail. Who took the blame? Do you see the shadows? God's trying to get our attention. Isaiah 53, it's an incredible chapter. Read it sometime. It says the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He took the blame. He bore the sin of many and makes intercession for the transgressors, the nabals of us. Jesus says, Father, let Carl's blame fall on me. He's guilty. We all know that. I'm innocent. But let me take it. What a beautiful picture she is. I'm sure you see the shadows. Let me just make this editorial's note. This is one reason why how, as a married couple, we treat our spouses is so important. Because marriage was designed to be a picture between Christ and his church. And it was designed to be forever because Christ is forever committed to his church and will never leave it nor forsake it. And out of response for that, the church responds in submission and honor and never walks away. Even when one is guilty, the other does not hold that guilt against them. 
such as Abigail and Nabal. Abigail, I want you to notice, in marriage, and I'm, this isn't, just isn't for women with their husbands or, or men with their wives. It's for both. Both husband and wife, notice this. Abigail didn't berate, didn't disown, and didn't talk bad about. Even when marriage gets rough, even when that person is not who they're supposed to be, the lesson we learn is that we don't berate, we don't disown, and we don't talk bad about. She didn't go to her prayer circle and offer, ask them to pray for her husband. She didn't start a Facebook group about, you know, moms who are in bad situations, you know. She doesn't say anything about this man when she could. And if you've been in marriage any length of time, like more than a day, you know that there are times, right? And this is why the Bible places such importance on marriage. Because the way a husband and wife treat each other is a picture to the world of Jesus' love. And that's why it says, submit to one another. And in submission, husbands, love your wives like Christ loved the church and give yourself up for her. And in submission, wives, submit to your husband and honor him. Because there's a spiritual, eternal picture that's at stake. And if you're not married, I would charge you to think about marriage like this. Not who do you like enough to marriage, not who can I live with forever, but who provides us the opportunity to be the picture of Christ to the world. That's the point of marriage. Is the person I'm getting serious with the one that together we can provide this fuller picture of Christ to the world? Abigail could have let the king just destroy Nabal. And if you think about it, that was probably her way out. I got a legal reason to get out of this thing. I'm going to let the king do what he wants to do. He's going to get what he deserves. But Abigail knew something that we often forget, that that is not how we've been treated by the Savior. And so she's not going to treat Nabal that way. It's profound. As bad as Nabal was, she let God handle the problems. And we'll see how God handles it later. but, But I just want to make this point, that maybe the circumstance that you find yourself in right now is God's opportunity for you to be the shadow of Jesus to your huddle. Abigail was in a really tough spot, and she chose to be the shadow of Christ, the redeemer, the intercessor in the midst of that. Maybe you're in a situation right now because God's giving you the opportunity to be the shadow of Jesus to your huddle. Just maybe. And maybe when we start to reframe our thinking that way, our prayer changes from God get me out, God change, to God help me be the witness of Christ in the midst of this. God's trying to get our attention. Now, it's not that Abigail doesn't acknowledge who she's married to. Look at verse 25. In verse 25, uh, she says, May my Lord pay no attention to that wicked man, Nabal. He is just like his name. His name is Fool. And folly goes with him. She's honest with the king about who who she's married to. Now, she doesn't tell everybody else about how foolish she is, but, but she does talk to the king. You understand what I'm saying, right? There's a king you can talk to about that thing you're in, but only the king. The king will pay attention. The king can do something about it. And she's just being honest. Nabal means fool. I don't know what his mommy and daddy were thinking when they're like, I christened thee fool. I mean, you're you're destined. I mean, you're setting the kid up, right? And so she's like, look, he's he's acting. And this is almost almost asking for mercy. Because she's saying, look, King, just have, he doesn't know. Just have mercy on him because he just fully, he just doesn't get it. 
Like, don't expect more out of him than what he's capable of. It's almost as if she it's almost as if she's asking for mercy by acknowledging who he is. And, and honestly, th- this is this is our story. Isaiah 4 or Jeremiah 4. My people are f- what? Fools. They do not know me. They're senseless children. They have no understanding. They're they're good at one thing, and 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 it's making evil. It's what the Bible says. They're skilled in doing evil. They know not how to do good. There's almost almost a request of mercy there. Look, this is who I am, so don't expect more of me than what I'm capable of. I'm just a fool sometimes. You've got to have mercy on me. And this is exactly what Jesus said from the cross, right? Just, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Have mercy on them. The story of Abigail in 1 Samuel 25 is the story of Christ and the cross. Because God's trying to get our attention. Do you see him? Verses 26 and 27, 28. Look what the Bible says. Now, since the Lord is, this Abigail talking to David, since the Lord has kept you, my master, from bloodshed, from avenging yourself by your own hands, which you had the right to do, as surely as the Lord lives and as you live, may your enemies and all who intend to harm you, harm my master, be like Nabal. She's saying, you are honored, you're protected, you are right in all you do, and you're untouchable, is what she's saying. And then verse 27. And let this gift which your servant has brought to my master be given to the men who follow you. Please forgive your servant's offense. Who was, who made the offense? Nabal. And she's taken on herself. Abigail offers a sacrifice on behalf of the evil man. Just what Jesus did for us. Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. So there was the the righteous, right king, right in all his judgments, right in, 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 in leveling that judgment against this evil man and intercedes for them this person who offers a gift and a sacrifice to appease the wrath of the king so that the evil one isn't destroyed. I know you see the shadow. And it's all because of grace. The king looked after Nabal and all his, because of grace. Nabal didn't ask for it, didn't deserve it. Because of grace. The offering was offered on Nabal's behalf. He didn't ask for it, he didn't deserve it. But it was grace. It's the story of Christ. It's a Christmas story. While we were yet sinners, he died. Like he came to earth when we didn't, we're not looking for him. Of grace. Verses 33 and 34 and 35. David says to Abigail, May you be blessed for your good judgment and for keeping me from bloodshed this day and from avenging myself with my own hands. Otherwise, as surely as the Lord lives, the God of Israel lives who has kept me from harming you, if you had not come quickly to meet me, not one male belonging to Nabal would have been left alive by daybreak. And David accepted from her hand what she had brought and said, go in peace. I've heard you. I've granted your request. This is the gospel. That the king offered the sacrifice that was given on behalf of the man who rejected him. It's a gospel. It's a Christmas story. This is why Jesus came. This was the whole purpose of Christmas. This is 1 Thessalonians 5. For God did not appoint us to suffer wrath, but to receive salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. There was wrath that had to be paid and had to be leveled against our sin. And it was. It just wasn't leveled against us. Because of Jesus, 
and his free gift of salvation offered on the cross. But then this, this story comes kind of full circle, uh, and it doesn't have a good ending for one of them. See, Nabal was acting in ignorance this whole time. He was acting in ignorance. He was still at fault. He was just ignorant at fault. But, but watch how this story kind of concludes, verse 36 through 38. When Abigail went to Nabal, he was in the house holding a banquet like that of a king. It's so interesting to me that he was rejecting the king all the while acting like the king of his own life. You see the shadow. Holding a banquet like that of a king. He was in high spirits and very drunk. So she told him nothing until daybreak. Then in the morning when Nabal was sober, his wife told him all these things. And his heart failed him and he became like a stone. And 10 days later, the Lord struck Nabal and he died. Now, this isn't the resolution to the marriage thing I was talking about earlier. Like, like oh Lord, I'm going to leave it in your hands. Just remember 1 Samuel 25 for me. You know, that's, that's, that's not what, that's. The, the thing I want to draw your attention to in that is this. At one time, Nabal was ignorant. He just didn't know. And he was foolish. But then he heard the truth of what occurred about his own evilness, about the gift that was given to save him, about the mercy and the king that didn't destroy him because of the gift that was offered. He heard the truth. And rather than admit who he was and his need to accept the gift that was offered for him, he continued to live in rejection and denial of the king. And the result was what? Death. This is the gospel. The wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. There is a cost to sin. One of two people are going to bear it. You bear the cross for your sin, or you accept that wrath being poured on Jesus. But someone's going to die. Jesus has taken that initiative. While we were still sinners, reject him. He still chose to do it. And all we have to do is accept that gift. But if we continue to live in rejection of the king, rejection of that gift, the result is what should have been absorbed by him, poured out on us. I know you see the shadow. Friends, this is, this is the purpose of Christmas, and this is the gift of Christmas that God is working to get our attention. He has from day one. He's still at work to get your attention in your life right now. Like I said, perhaps the things that are going on in your life right now are so that you will realize that your story is about his story. And in the middle of what is even very difficult times, you say, I will be the shadow of Jesus to my huddle. And by that, God will redeem what I'm going through. He's working every day to get your attention and draw your attention to Christ. The question is, are you paying attention? The greatest Christmas gift that is ever offered is the gift of his son. And the greatest gift that you could ever offer is the gift of your life. Romans 12 says, therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, as the good king, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. The best gift you could give is the gift of your life in response to the graciousness of this benevolent king who has accepted the gift of his son on your behalf to turn away his wrath. I know you see those shadows.
pay attention. I want you to pray with me. Father, thank you. Thank you that you have loved us with an everlasting love. That we were, while we rejected you, you chose us. That you will never leave us nor forsake us. Thank you for your mercies that are new every morning. Thank you for your faithfulness that is great. And thank you for your grace that blesses the undeserving, unmerited of us. In response to you, in response to what you've done, and in response to the gift of your son given to us, we give ourselves to you. If you've never taken that step, you've never solidified that relationship today is your day it's real simply done and it is profoundly impacting but the simplicity is simply and is accepting by faith to come before God and say God I accept the gift of Jesus to turn my wrath on your wrath for me onto him. If you've never done that, I encourage you to do that right now. Father, I accept the gift of Jesus that turns your wrath for me onto him. I believe it by faith, and I accept it by faith. And today I choose you, because I know you've already chosen me. Father, I thank you so much that you have been working all the time to grab our attention. I I pray that we wouldn't miss you. Turn our attention toward you. There are some of us in this place, God, that are just going through it. And it feels like we're in no-win situations. And it feels like we're in, in cisterns that, in holes that are so deep and so dark, light can't even penetrate. It feels as though some of us are in the, the flood waters and the, the waters right up to our neck. It feels like we're in those, the, the, the valleys of the shadow of death and all there are are shadows and there's no light. There are some of us who are just going through it. Father, we certainly do pray for your intercession and your intervention. You are a good God. You're a gracious God. You're a faith God. You'll never leave us alone. And so we count on that. We expect all that your grace will allow us. Certainly that's true, Father. But in the same breath, you have people here, God, who are yours. And our prayer is that we would be the shadow of Christ in the midst of those times. Draw our attention to that. Draw our priority to that. And in that, redeem all of it. your name I pray over us, Jesus. Amen. Listen, if this finally made sense to you where it hasn't before, I want you to tell me either by filling out that card, give it to me, put it in the box back there, stop by the Start Here booth, let us know online. I want to be able to walk with you and help you in this. But if you you have understood this and and you're good with God, my encouragement to you is is let the, the another understanding of the story of Christ and what's been done for you, pull you and draw you and, and, and make it come alive inside you so that there's a new level of passion. There's a new depth of commitment. There's a newness and a joy in crawling on the altar and giving yourself on the altar to God. Let it be fresh again and powerful again. He loves you. I would say one more thing. That if you want some other resources to help you understand some of the deepness of our faith, I wrote that book, Foundations, and it's at our start here, but just pick it up for free. You don't got to pay us anything for it. Just pick it up. I want you to grow in your knowledge and understanding of this thing called Christianity. Just pick one up. It's my gift to you. You got it? Yeah? Listen, I'm excited to go through next week. We're going to look at another part of the Old Testament and see Jesus in it. It's a lot of fun, man. Caleb, can we sing one more?